welcome again to the Dodcast. I'm your host, Luke Dodson, and I'm talking to combatives instructor, outdoors enthusiast, and historian Mark Taylor about rites of passage and the mysteries of the wild. So, I would introduce you, I guess, to my viewers as a man of few words and many skills. Um, which, uh, so that's, that's, that'd be my sort of nutshell summary. Um, uh, but today I think we were going to talk about some of your views on uh, Norse, Northern animism uh, and some of the, the sort of the animal cults that, that, um, that we were talking about in the other podcast. Yeah, so <clears throat> it was interesting. I, I really enjoyed listening to that. Um, and, you know, just to lift off, probably, I think the easiest thing to do is just to, so what I said to you in private, which was acknowledging the whole Icelandic um, parallel with the shield, shield matters of the Icelandic outlaw saga and the Beowulf saga hmm. uh, with the shield maiden. Uh, point I thought that was amazing and uh, something that uh, I've kind of been exploring myself a bit with the idea of the placement of where the shield maiden is in the sort of modern ethos but to go on to the whole uh, wolf cult or bear cult or boar cult I mean the the, the bear and the boar I think um, marry up quite well mm -hmm. and the whole rite of passage aspect um, because I think those are kind of quite intrinsic between the sort of uh, cults, animal cults, particularly those pred predatory ones, the wolf, the bear, they're the two, the two most famous. Um, I think you have to look at the rights behind it, mm. in my understanding. So, mm. uh, so there's historians and there's people that will look at sagas and what have we. From my personal experience with what I do, uh, I've looked more at the right ritual or rights parallels and why we have to have rights and what the importance of them are yeah yeah so that's kind of more the direction that i look at so my understanding it's quite interesting because listening to that last podcast it was great um that i personally uh, I see the, the I completely echo the thought on the the boar the bear as this warrior persona that will fight the bats against the wall but stand solitary and whereas the wolf and this is why I think there's the difference a wolf hunts as a pack hmm. and so I think that the two if when you listen to the two or look at the two cults that have appeared in the past the curios sort of um, the wolf cult, I think, stems more to the, speaks more to the boy going to the wild to return as a man, but they do it as a pack. Whereas the the bear cult or boar cult is the solitary journey of the warrior throughout the ages. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So that was my take on it. And then if you if you look back in history in history uh, or actually not even in history i think now is a perfect time to look at this um the need for rites of passage in men are becoming more and more of a thing and why is that why do men need more rites of passage these days why is it that they feel that they're boys and they can be 40 50 and still they haven't passed into what it is to be a to, to be a man why is that and that's the question that i've posed to myself to others and then found that the looking in the past brings up some of those answers yes yes so the 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 curios, for those who are unfamiliar this is uh, i i believe this is a sort of reconstructed indo-european term is that right yeah so i think it is in, it, it, i think that there's a a the terminology fits for uh, a wide spectrum of uh, rites of passage, particularly evolving from the boy into uh, when he becomes a man. Yeah. And uh, that kind of transcends from everywhere from India all the way through to North Europe. Africa have many rites of passage like that. 
Mm. Uh, I have heard of similar things in South, Southern America, mm. uh, rites of passage. Uh, I mean, the Indians still, there are parts of India where, you know, boys will go and survive in the wild uh, for, you know, I think it's a few months over the summer period, but that still exists to the day as a rite of passage. Mm. Mm. Um, and so that term, I think, from the Indo-European aspect, fits very well for that that particular rite of passage, which I could say it's a multicultural thing, really. Yes. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that, you, you know, as you get the, the shift towards a, um, a more settled uh, society, you know, and a, a more kind of domesticated society, you have these rites of passage where people return, the, the, the boys are taken out to the, the forest or the, you know, the local wilderness, and they, they return to the sort of the, the hunter-gatherer, the forager way of life for that period of time and then kind of come back into the more sort of village life the 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 settled life of the of the um you know the the the, the people that they they belong to mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think for me the 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 topic or the reasoning behind it um if we look at the if we look at women uh, in particular, or girls. So a girl is a girl until she she starts her journey into womanhood, um, which you know sometimes is signified by in some cultures the first period is the beginning of that journey, and eventually she becomes a woman, and that hits her prime of you know vitality, um, you know of learning, wisdom starts to develop, and then eventually there is this. Uh, change again biological change that maybe signifies into becoming an elder where the the same sort of reproductive changes happen on the other side and then they become the the elder I think the thing is with boys uh, in particular is is that they are brought up in many cultures and this is historical as well as um, as the same as what girls are and then there hits a point uh, where because they don't have necessarily a biological change other than yeah okay the deep the voice deepens testosterone starts to land balls drop etc but there needs to be an artificial stimuli that stimuli that takes them from being in the care of the woman to joining the man um whether that is that they go off and that's an artificial thing of growing as a group uh, and returning as men and earning their place like what you said actually it's a great parallel that people are seeking to go out into the woods to recreate these kind of things or wild or have whatever experiences to then return to the city like they've earned it that's very true for that that particular wolf cult that the the boys have to go off as a pack and then only when they've come back from that journey are they welcomed and uh, uh, accepted as men in the fold Hmm. and the interesting thing with that is is that as the the men progress so once you, you're a boy and you've established that, you've become a man, when do you become an elder? Because again, we don't have that biological change. It's a much more subtle thing. So mm. the, where does the warrior become an elder? Mm. And the graceful journey from that. And I think that uh, what we see a lot in our society is either boys that have never had the right of passage to become a man, or boys that have just become elders but have never become a man, so don't have the basing of what it is to be a true elder in the community. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I see it more and more with every successive generation of young men um, that, that there's something, I mean, there's, there's a particular kind of lostness that I see in each gender and in, in you know, young men and young women. Um, mm-hmm. It manifests in different ways, but with each sort of successive generation of, you know, of young men, there's a sort of greater kind of disembodiment and kind of unease and sort of clunkiness to their movements and uh, hesitance. And sometimes it sort of gets dressed up in um, a kind of really weird set of behaviors sort of this kind of TikTok sort of like camp dance routines or whatever it's like I've got got no problem with people being camp or whatever but it, it's like there's this sort of strange kind of 
uh, uh, a strange thing has happened. I think it's like the teenage boys are behaving in ways that even when I was a, a young lad, you know, back in sort of mid 2000s or so, that, it, that would have been considered really odd. But now they're kind of doing all these sort of like mm, kind of dancing around with weird TikTok routines and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, there is something increasingly it's artificial and and it is interesting that yeah there's, there's also this this counter push of you know uh within the, the 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 circle that we're involved in as well that, that, that of trying to get away from the the city and the urbanized and the, the mechanized which is kind of jamming up people's hormones and their bodies and all the rest of it and yeah and, and making them quite disembodied i think yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say about the 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 dancing thing because the, the dancing is is actually so for me the right passage um, the, the rites of passage you see for men's rites of passage they involve bloodletting in one way or another you know the hunt yeah the the face in the rival tribe to fight maybe a tribal wrestling match mm. um, maybe. Uh, maybe even just that sort of um, the mating dances that you see in certain African cultures. I've seen, you know, that expressed um, amazingly where the men are, you know, dancing on one leg, putting sticks into the ground. But it, that that comment you just you just said there just reminded me of the time when I was, oh man, I must have been 18 and I was in Cyprus visiting some friends and I was in this small village um and one of my friends turns around and says uh, there was a wedding and the uh, a young man got up and he and my friend said oh he's our village dance champion nice village, <laughs> village dance champion <laughs> and so this guy gets up and he does this traditional dance and uh and all the women you could see you looked around the women and they sat there looking over in awe of all different age groups as he danced and it was it was a macho thing, mm. not a not a not feminine thing in any shape or shape or form. It was like raw masculinity. Uh, and then after some of the other men got involved and did their thing, and the next thing that the music changed and people were dancing as couples and so on and so on. But I thought it was interesting to have a village dance champion. So instead of the warrior, like the warrior culture thing that you see in various things this they had a village dance champion and I, so i wanted to know where the other village which who's the other villages where are their champions they all dance champions but uh yeah I'll, just uh just something just reminded me of that it's pretty uh pretty uh pretty crazy parallel but what i do think can be the case i'm not saying it is always the case is that the societies now is very heavy on uh, men using the tools that traditionally women tended to use, good or bad. And so us men are very quickly criticised uh, for our tempers, aggression, and um, prone to, to physical reactions, which is ancestrally tends to be our role as the hunter, as the protector, as the warrior. And the whereas the woman is very, very um, skilled um, at being peacemakers, at, diplomacy uh, getting their feelings across um you know you only have to see a group of women that have never met before a party uh, uh, an event and they quite quickly will form a circle and start to talk about things and then you can come back 20 minutes later and they'd be talking about things that you know men will never talk about no matter how how long they've been together um amazing but i think that there's a there's a, a real um, push for men to express their feelings in the same way that women do. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's, what you see in things like TikTok is a clumsy attempt by a lot of men to do that badly. Mm. And so it comes off as just contrived and the unnatural version of what, you know, deep down they're trying to express something, but that this isn't our tools, this isn't our language, we don't have the skill set to speak it. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it also is uh, i like the the story you tell about the the 
the dance champion in Cyprus because the, the traditional forms of dance and very often you'd have these uh, specific dance forms that were for men and for women and, mm. and that you know that sort of TikTok sort of selfie like whatever it is doing some strange performance on social media is a, a like you say another really kind of distorted garbled attempt to do that same thing which is basically to express yourself in your own natural bodily way which is going to be have specific elements to your you know your culture your 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 sex your uh you know your even your village and you know who your parents are and all these sorts of things and every that that sort of beautiful expression of individuality that you see in these traditional dances that my my dad's quite keen on the sort of youtubing various sort of folk dances from around the world and sending sending me them uh, so you see these amazing guys from like georgia and azerbaijan and like afghanistan all these places and Sometimes they're doing really like aggressive, vigorous dances where they're jumping up and down. And then sometimes they're like hardly moving at all. And they're just like sort of waggle their fingers a little bit, but it's really effective, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, <clears throat> there's so many, there's so many different ways of, of, of expressing as humans. And, um, uh, you know, there, there's, there's sort of, again there's these sort of different tendencies people being pulled towards the mass and the you know what the mass media is telling them that this is this is how it's okay to behave and um you know there's so many other so many other options there available i mean i think that there's it's interesting what you just said there exactly is is this kind of leads me on to my next point really that if you look at what we're told now is that local is kind of uh, selfish so the idea of having your village dancing champion or your your town's folk dance or custom you like where i live down south east sussex we have um tradition of throwing cider at trees at various times of the year to provoke you know to, to get a better harvest Hmm. who knows how long that comes back i've got some ideas but it, it's not really relevant for me to necessarily go into the historical context of it but it's there and it's a tradition you know we have a quite famous bonfire night um, bonfire societies where where i am and we do some crazy stuff we burn some effigies of some amazing things you know i've seen donald trump the pope um margaret thatcher um and even Jim, Jim will fix it. Jimmy Savile burned uh, various uh, stages and as effigies. So, you know, this is probably a custom, a way of uh, a localized custom that survived to this area. And uh, I think sometimes when we try to say that local or local customs and, and um, uh, I guess, uh, I suppose rights is a word in a way, are um are like insular or weird i think we missed the point it's actually kind of a bonding experience it's a way of small communities to get together to kind of build strengths and friendships mm. because it's very hard to just say like i'm english you're english right we can say that but what does that mean it's it doesn't really mean anything now you know that can be a such a it's such a complicated complicated thing and I'm from the south, you know, you're southern based as well. Um, yeah, we've got friends of ours or colleagues um, and, you know, people that we associate with that can be from up north, can be Scottish, can be from wherever, you know. Mm -hmm. And culturally, it is different. Um, and they all live in the United Kingdom, but culturally we're massively different in different parts. And that's great. You know, I, I love hearing the weird nuances of friends of mine that live in Cornwall or... <laughs> you know, Newcastle or London. I mean, London, I find the cities like just blows my mind whenever I go into London and it's a complete urban jungle and everyone that lives there is like a survivalist of the jungle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a skill, you know, I've got a friend of mine who's 
half um, half Jamaican and half Yorkshireman. And he grew up in Tottenham and his language is like urban and some of the stuff he comes out with and has spoken to me about, I have never would never have experienced. Um, different ethnicity to me, um, but he, you know, he's in touch with his Jamaican roots and we talk about things and you're like, whoa, that's a complete different culture. Mm. He's more skilled at surviving in an urban environment than I ever could be. Mm. Um, I know I went on a bit of a tangent there, but it, 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 we it, embracing what's local, mm. I think, creates massive bonds. Trying yeah. to say we're all like one people, let's just all be this sort of blanket wash of English means nothing. Yeah, yeah. And, and even beyond that, the sort of the, the globalised, globalist tendency to sort of just smush everything together and it, you know, coming back to the the you know the thing about gender is that that's it's also what we're seeing with men and women. And I think that actually we're told that that's great and that it's the way to go forward. And there's some people, and there probably always has been some people who that does actually apply to that they don't necessarily they feel more uh, in touch with the the opposite sex in some way. Um, and that, that, you know, there's always been those, you know, those, those, those outliers. Um, but to kind of push everybody into this, like, this kind of mush of just, just mix it all together, make the, you know, encourage the women to be masculine and the men to be feminine. It seems to me like people aren't really happy like that. They actually want the opposite sex to be more like them and they want to be more like themselves so yeah which is exactly why coming back to you know the, there's this growing interest amongst men for the kind of rites of passage that we we've been involved in or um amongst the, you know the similar tendencies amongst women uh which you know that have their own flavor and distinctions which I, i'm only aware of uh sort of from the peripheries and from the you know as a as an observer from the outside but yeah yeah i mean uh, women have women have uh, definitely hit hitting it hard when it comes to just natural rites of passage and the way that they effortlessly can form friendships and support circles and 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 really bring out the best of each other uh, in each other. It's quite interesting that um, one of my colleagues for a while has been talking to me about the idea of doing um, what I do and facilitating for women. And I've always kept my hand back at that and said, "Look, I am not a woman. I actually have problem with these." Um, the, the certain women that go out there and tell men that no they need to do this xyz they just you know act in a, in a way that the women communicate as men and you should do that and that's how that's how you are going to get you know success and evolve as a person and kind of heal wounds and trauma and so on and so on and that I've always has always rubbed me up the wrong way because you know my experience is that men um, cannot communicate in the same way for the it, it, exceptions to every rule uh, AA for example Alcoholics Anonymous they um, the the routine program I've got some friends of mine that have, have been involved in that program for a long time um, but, but there's a structure in place so that's that transcends gender but the men are always slower to account for their own feelings and this whole sort of get people thrown in a circle um, and talk about how you feel. There'll be one or two that are emotional wreck and, and openly comfortable with doing so, crying and what have we. And every, all the other men are like, oh, what's going on here? Whereas if you get men going off doing a task of some sort, things, and there's a bit of respect and a bit of credit with each other, mm -hmm. you start to go, well, do you know what? That guy he's got some heart on him he might not be the biggest guy but look what he's doing or you know cool that guy knows a lot about this you start to when you start to build a bit of respect a bit of bond then you can start to address 
those emotional or whatever else comes up. And so I think that the methods um, the men and women use should be different. And to go back on your your point before with the the, the droginessness uh, of it all, what I think a lot of what comes or surfacing is people confusing sexuality, which is just a fetish, with gender. And uh, I've had this conversation uh, with you know friends of mine that are, that are gay, um, you know lesbians or homosexuals, and um, you know, they get it. They get that we are, you're not your sexuality. You're not what you're into. Um, you can be a man, um, you know, a masculine man and be gay, that's fine. Or you can be a feminine woman and be gay. It makes no difference or straight, whatever. Um, but yeah, I think that people confuse their sexuality just because they are gay, that means they have to act feminine or just because they are, um, yeah, or, you know, the, the, the opposite for you know, females that the, 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 are uh, gay, they have to act masculine. Mm. It doesn't matter. There's no define, there's no rules to that. You are who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So, but... It's interesting. Yeah. It's, you, you read novels from the sort of early 20th century and they'll depict uh, gay or people experiencing same sex attraction. And it's not framed as like, this is who they are. It's just something that they're experiencing at that point. And it, it's not like the text was like, oh, well, you know, obviously they, he was struggling with the idea of being gay. It's like, no, it's just like the guy fancies his mate or whatever it is, or the woman fancies her friend. And it's it's kind of obvious that it's not necessarily something that you talk about too much because it's sort of a bit taboo, but still it's not this like, this categorization of identity so yeah it's, it's interesting that as well you've got people like jack donovan as well who sort of promote this idea of the the, the androphile kind of this sort of like uh you know spin on the um it's sort of moving away from the gay subculture but for people who are you know experiencing that that attraction for themselves so yeah that's an interesting one in itself yeah, definitely. The, um, the, 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 the woman warrior, uh, which kind of ties in quite nicely with mm. that whole conversation, I find, so the, the whole rite of passage thing I've been avoiding with, with, with women for, for quite a long time. And um, something clicked not long ago, and it was really, and this is, that actually podcast touched nice on it, the last one, that the... For me, the shield made in place, I actually think um, <clears throat> is when the men fail to put to, uh, so the village, say, say your tribe goes to war with another tribe, the men go off to war because, you know, the women are skilled at foragers at holding the village together. You know, they're the peacekeepers. They essentially are the head of the house when it, they run house, you know, all this, the man's the head of the house, the woman is the head of the house. Man often traditionally would be the provider. Yes, they go off and do it, but the woman is she runs it. And, you know, in North European cultures, often they're in charge of money. It, it was bad luck to have the man in charge of money. Um, and so when that tribe loses, who protects the children? Who protects the next generation that come along? And that's where the shield maiden. I think finds a hard home it's, it's that that's where the woman's role is is the second line of defense mm. because they're too valuable you know um historically so many women dying in child, childbirth prior to medicine catching up woman, uh, w the woman isn't a resource that can throw itself whereas the man can throw himself into the unknown die and there'll be another man that will replace them mm. I think that's the thing is is that sometimes you know, me saying what I'm saying would be considered as chauvinistic. It's not chauvinistic at all. It's actually just the value, the appreciation that a woman can create life. Yeah. You know, they can, they can, if you're particularly spiritual, they can bring, you know, a life from another realm into the, into a human form and off it goes. Mm. You know, man's part of that process, but they're not carrying that with them for nine months. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It, it, someone I, I follow on Twitter called Grandson of Finn, who does a lot of interesting sort of 
Celtic sort of Gaelic content. Um, he made the point that the you know the, when the Romans wrote about how the Gauls, you know, the women would fight, and that the, they were really shocked by this because you know Roman women are very very sort of domestic and stay at home and just sort of doing you know, sewing or whatever it is. And you know these Gaulish women would be like coming out the huts and showing stuff at the Romans and you know challenging the fights and everything and you know that people have retrospectively looked back at the Celts and gone like oh well the Celts were like these sort of progressive feminists like where all the women were actually warriors as well it's like no no no. the the men were the warriors but the women were tough as shit as well because they had to be because they were you know they were they were uh you know a you know, hand to mouth, like Northern European farming, foraging, uh, and pastoral communities that that they needed to be, you know, physically strong. And when their children are being attacked by an enemy people, they're going to get involved in the fight as well. And that's, you know, that's natural. And it, you know, it's a credit to them as for their own power, and their own bravery and their strength. But it's not the same as saying, ah, well, that means that the women also went out to fight the wars on the same level as the men. I mean, maybe in some cases, I don't know. I mean, I haven't looked into it too much, but not from what I've read in, you know, the old Irish sagas, for example. Uh, you, you don't really get a sense of that. No, no, absolutely. I think, um, uh, so biologically, there's a difference between male and female. Men are have a, have many physical advantages for a matched roughly matched male and female and biologically there would be certain advantages to the male um but yeah i totally hear what you're saying i think that the gatherer aspect so hunters gatherers i think the gatherer aspect actually turned into the farmer in some respects and i think that the man probably still would be off hunting or fighting or raiding or whatever it is and the the woman would be looking after the children birthing the children looking after the children and running the farm tending to livestock you know, harvesting, all of these things, the man will come back and assist. I do think, you know, it, it, people turn around as, and I've had conversations before, and I said, you know, women are tough as hell. They're tougher than men because they can, you know, run a house, raise the children, <laughs> pick up the sword in this particular case, you know, to defend. I mean, you want to see true aggression. You threaten a woman's child. Mm-hmm. End of. Yeah. Yeah, most dangerous animal in the wild is going to be, you know, the mama bear. Absolutely. And yet, well, this is what started it. I saw, and this is the interesting thing, this is where the shield maiming come in. I saw this, these, these, um, you, you, you know, you see these bears in the wild and with the cubs, and they will protect their cubs from other males coming in. Mm. And it's, I've heard other people speaking about it before. And once you dial your head into it, you see on these wildlife programs, you can see. The, the you know females of various species will protect their cubs from other men from other males you know you see it in the cat kingdom you see or big cat kingdom you see it in bears you see it in various animals um where they the the that is really the shield maiden personified mm. Mm. you know sitting in docu- wildlife documentaries um i remember seeing a bear um and she was her final season um of being able to to mate and she had her cub with her and she had to cross through this. She was in season and she was crossing through this plane and there's other, other male bears looking to, to mate with her. And she was hiding her cub behind her leg to, 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 to go through that journey and sacrificing the last time to be able to, um, to, to bring life into the world, mm. to protect that life of hers, to protect that cub. That is the shield maiden personified in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's a shield she's carrying, not sword. Yes, yeah. No, it's 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 also it kind of makes me think also of the um, the myth of Excalibur, where the, <laughs> uh, the you know the the sword. Of, I think it's Merlin at one point. In one of the the uh, the tales. He, he asked Arthur, you, "You've got a you've got a sword and you've got a scabbard. Which one's the more important?" And Arthur's a young guy, he's like, well, obviously the sword, I mean, you know, chop people up, it's brilliant. But you know, it's, Merlin says, no, 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 it's not, that's not it. It's the scabbard, because the scabbard will, is, has the properties of protection. 
and a scabbard actually is the thing that that keeps him safe is you know it's a particularly magical one that has some sort of kind of spell on it but in a yeah the the that being able to sheath the blade as well to you know to kind of um there's a lot of yeah there's a lot going on there in terms of archetypal stuff of being able to control your own emotions uh and aggression that sort of thing as well but yeah it made me think of that in terms of the the sword and the shield mm. yeah i like that i like that i mean i think that it's kind of quite a good um explanation of the young man the young warrior isn't it you know the young warrior goes out wants the swords because he thinks that that's what he needs to win the win the win the war but knowing when to draw the sword mm. or not to draw the sword like the whole samurai thing of um the, one of the earliest martial arts i ever studied was uh ei Iido or ei jitsu and my sensei years ago was talking about how samurai would walk and those young warriors would walk with the sword the black end of it sticking right out so they could knock into someone and then that would didn't that would start the duel whereas the older samurai would walk with the sword up because they know that if they clash that might turn into a duel mm. and i think that's the same difference as the, the, the what you what you're talking about there the young young buck wants the sword because you know that's the most important thing mm. whereas the uh the 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 older warrior or the the guy that's moving towards the elder realizes hang on i might want to keep this in the scabbards you know yeah. i might not want to let might not want to let my guns off so quickly here <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just the 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 experiences i've had where my you know my my temper or my ego has it's been fairly rare but there's been you know one or two instances where i've run my mouth off or flip someone off and it's like oh no why did I do that <laughs> so and it's a learning experience but yeah it's just, you know the the real martial arts masters you can tell they just they never do anything like that because they know that it's you know it's uh it's it's just not 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 really uh not really worth it a lot of the time but yeah yeah it's it's yeah it's interesting yeah yeah, I mean, O-sensei from uh, the School of Aikido refers to the fact to injure your enemies to injure yourself. I love that uh, particular saying. Because there's always a price, price to pay. Um, whether you believe in karma or not, somewhere down the line, there's going to be uh, a consequence for every action. Um, so to lose control to that base emotion, at somewhere is going to, um, yeah, it's going to catch up with you, isn't it? Um, in fact, that's how this journey started for me was the fact that I would um, immersed myself in a particular way of thinking and it, eventually things come out, they spasm out and uh, aggression is one of those that if you are not aware of or mindful of or even incorporate it or harness it, I, this is, I think this is a big flaw that we see now with our society is, is that they see someone being aggressive. Oh, they're a bad guy. They're out of control. They're this, they're that. You know, they don't see necessarily the pain or the reasoning or the frustration behind it. And um, as as a society, since we've progressed and away from, I mean, things are considered barbaric to to fight or to contact sports, um, uh, rough and tumble. You know, I'd fall out of trees as a child and cut myself. My children now, you know, if they were to fall out of a tree, it'd be a massive drama. I mean, my dad's idea of, unless it was flapping, open skin, bleeding, it was stick it down and a bit of super glue on it. You know, that was his idea to his remedy to most things. It 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 it, it makes you appreciate by um, the consequences or frig or how fragile we are as human beings. Hmm. So you're a bit less keen to get involved in violence when you know how fragile you are, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a, the real value, I think, of studying fighting arts and martial arts is just understanding the, the stakes of like, oh, you know, when you get sort of clocked in a sparring round and, you know, particularly if the, whoever you're sparring with isn't, that good at holding their punches back and you you feel it and you're like oh right yeah this isn't this isn't good <laughs> so yeah it, yeah yeah 
someone a, a friend I worked with a, a, a colleague and uh, actually one of my mentors as I, I, I could say a sensei of mine uh, he he had, uh, he had this app or uh, website that he was part of and it indicated every single time a one punch knockout killed someone in the UK and he when we were working he'd go oh another one oh another one oh another one um and it obviously always happened on you know busy nights bank holiday weekends always sort of do prime time of it and it's the the, the the reason i think that you used to do it or take note of it is because it proves how fragile we're as human beings it's not the punch that's killed them it's the the fall that after mm. you know, bang the head the second time and that shows everything you need to know about how fragile human beings are. And doesn't matter how tough you are, you get um, you get that unlucky hit on you. You land. It's all over, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and you know, as human beings, we're not designed for. Uh, I think it was Jordan Peterson talks about it. About we're not designed for killing. Really, um, you know, we don't have claws. We don't have armor protection. Um, yeah, our bodies are designed to survive. Yes, our skulls are quite a, a unique piece of engineering. Um, you know, our, our skeletal structure is pretty good as well. And, you know, our reflexes, I, I talk quite a bit about our reflexes and our, our ancestral gifts or biological gifts and how they can get us out of situations. Um, but they're usually designed for us to endure a short period of hardship to get out or to destroy whatever the the threat is um which to me says that we're not designed to endure it like there's certain animals in the animal kingdom that are amazing at what they do you know um from a hunting point of view from a being prey from avoidance of being killed um we're we need two things to survive which is society and tools without society and tools we don't do so well yeah um in fact arguably we 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 don't thrive so um you know when i've heard had people turn around to me and said oh you you know mark you live out in the middle of nowhere and do all the things that you do you i'm sure you're looking forward to when society caves in well no not really because that's one of the two things we need to survive you know Without tools, it's very hard to survive. Without society, it's very hard to survive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I hear you there. I mean, it, like you were saying uh, in one of the, the the private chats, that there's a lot of a lot of people sometimes need a bit of a reality check in terms of what you know, what a society collapse or what a civil war or whatever it is would actually look like. And I've never experienced any of those things, but I've spoken to enough people and read enough accounts of what it's like to know that there's uh, you know i I, i'd struggle (laughs) i know that (laughs) and you know it's part of the you know the journey that that i'm on with you guys is to make myself a little bit a little bit more prepared a little bit you know a little bit uh, uh more adaptable to that kind of scenario uh the worst case scenario but yeah, it's not, you know, I, I understand the feeling because I've had that sort of sci-fi kind of post-apocalypse sort of movie running in my head, you know, and the, the kind of computer game version of it where it's all just kind of a bit of a laugh and it's kind of strategy and sort of, you know, the rules are gone. But, you know, basically you just go around finding your your toolkits everywhere in like convenient places with like very very like gradually staged levels of challenge that <laughs> and you can always save and go back so you know it's fine um but yeah reality isn't really like that so no i mean i think that's the one of i remember watching the mad max films and and i mean obviously regardless of the amazing camp 80s-ness of of the costume and what have we um that scene where he's sat there with the the helicopter guy and they've got the can of dog food and he's chowing down on his can of dog food and flips it over and then the dog sort of eats out the remnants of it um and um uh, you know i'd love to get the people that go yeah you know i'd love for a societal breakdown you know we're thrive you know they've watched walking dead and think they're going to be team negan or whatever it is 
um, yet they can't do a push up now or, or, you know, walk down the road without getting out of breath. I'd love to just give them a can of dog food and say, tell you what, chow down on that. If you can get through that, maybe you might survive because that's about as good as it'll probably get a few years into it. Um, and that would be the reality check that some people need. But yeah, there you go. That's that. Um, yeah, not, not, I, yeah, I don't think the reality would of a societal breakdown wouldn't be, wouldn't be a very pleasant one. And there are films out there that really show that. Um, and they're, and they're not nice. I mean, that film, The Road, anyone that's, um, anyone that wants to get into the whole, you know, fantasy of what that would be like, I think that's pretty bleak, grim film that expresses it quite well. There's loads of others that have been around for various years, but I, I like watching those because it just reminds me, do you know what? I'm quite thankful of being able to go to the shop down the road and buy what I need and, um, you know, go pop out how many restaurants have you got now you can go out and have whatever you want to eat whatever night roof over your head you don't have to worry about someone bursting your door i mean uh, most places that are outside of a massively urban environment people don't lock their doors during the day yeah yeah exactly. no. yeah so that's a big uh, highlight or a big plus for society yeah um as flawed as it is, I mean, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but it's it's definitely better than the idea of a free for all. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. So yeah, that's my particular take on that one, mm. which you've heard many times. My uh, <laughs> my um my views on that one, but mm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to hear a little bit about your background with Norse animism if you'd be up for talking mm. about that how, how did you get get involved in that originally well so personally so this is this is a very personal journey and it's not like so i have read books and i have uh reached out to various communities uh so i always struggled with particularly people that were trying to reconnect to their north european heritage or religion uh, philosophy and so on and they would essentially use the abrahamic approach so the odinistic kind of attitude you see i've met many people i'm an odinist oh brilliant um i want to go to valhalla ah oh, right oh, okay brilliant again you know if you understand the philosophy behind that um you know the uh, you have to die in battle the best were picked and didn't go to Valhalla it was the second best that went to Valhalla and I think that that's a very um purposeful thing of that um this the best never tend to improve much because they've hit their top Whereas the second best always want to be the best. So they always they'd be the ones most willing to fight. Um, and so this whole Odinistic uh, approach that you'd see in this sort of revival or recreation um, of spirituality, uh, for me, just didn't sit well. Um, whereas the my own journey uh, was part, I guess, shamanistic in some respects. And um, I had a, a teacher who you're familiar with. He comes from um, a Native American lineage and understanding and schooling. I've got other, another good colleague and friend of mine who comes from a Toltec uh, perspective and the understanding that, that, um, that there, are, there, there are more to this world than just deities. Uh, or, or the idea of a deity that, you know, land spirits, um, land has energy, places have energy. We've all been in a situation, we've walked into somewhere and it's just got a bad energy about it. Mm. What is that? Is that the people? Is that the place? That curiosity is what stepped me forward into this journey. Um, and so for me, that led me to a more um, animistic approach of, um, perhaps instead of asking gods god for help um honoring the idea of honoring the gods or ancestors but of connecting with um the land spirits or the spirits of the area 
um, stood or energy, if you want to call it energy, of the area. And I think you see that a lot, particularly you spoke about the Celts earlier, um, you know, Ireland offering, you know, bowls of milk and food to the local, the local sprites and entities. And you see this in loads of other cultures as well. Um, the African, the South, I would lived in South Africa for a period and they would be worried about the Tokoloshi, which lived under the bed, um, which is, yeah, quite an interesting one as well. Mm. And you hear this a lot. It's, a, it's a, I think, quite an old truth to most cultures. So, yeah, that, that's what led me more towards that over the Abrahamic approach to representing or worshipping one deity in a um, polyethic religion or deity set. Mm, mm. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the Irish fairy tradition is very strong still. As I was watching an interview with a, an Irish farmer uh, who's he, he's got this plot of land which is just chock full of fairies and like people come from all over the world to get you know sort of help and blessings and stuff and it's oh he, he, he came from america yes he, he did come over here to get the get help from the fairies and i showed him there and there's the fairy over there and it's fantastic it's like uh, uh you know this living tradition uh that yeah it's it's common to it every every culture really um except yeah modern culture basically it's the only one that doesn't have it it's quite quite exceptional you know iceland that's what I, I i everyone talks about it whenever they talk about fairies and land land spirits iceland and i think i went there on my honeymoon and um I heard all the stories, which they, they're very great at crafting and passing on to the tourists. But I find that obviously Ireland, Iceland, both those kind of places, they still very much have that connection. You know, they were they will avoid reroute roads to not go through places. Mm. And I'm sure I don't know whether you're familiar with it, of the idea of being elf shot. So the Anglo-Saxons, even after converting to Christianity would still avoid certain places, ancient places of power for fear of being elf shot, which yeah. an elf would fire a little arrow into you and it would make you sick or kind of a mini curse, I guess. Mm. That was that predated, that was way after the conversion to Christianity. Mm. Yeah, there's quite a few sort of little words that uh hangovers from that time like elf shot and sort of pixie lead and and things like that of like just getting completely lost in a tiny patch of woodland <laughs> just wandering around for ages they call it being pixie lead you know so. <laughs> yeah i mean uh, i've heard stories of people that are very trained in navigation that have wandered into the wrong spot and managed to find themselves being spun around and yeah i mean that's uh uh, yeah, maybe that's maybe it's the elves playing some some games, playing some fun. Mm. Uh, I I had a, a panic phone call from some friends, and I'm not going to go too much into it because just in case they see this, but I will briefly skirt on it. Um, and they uh, they went to camp in a particular spot. I'm not going to say where it is, uh, but they did some wild camping, stealth camping, and I get this phone call, uh, quite panicked. Um, one of them had heard a nursery rhyme being sung as the other one went off to the toilet. And uh, as he come back, uh, he told him about that. And then they heard the tree shaking, wolves crying and all of these things. And uh, I said, uh, I said to them, did you, because originally one of them had fallen out his hammock and it was all very laughing and playful. And I said, did you, you know, going nice and slowly and set up and offer something to that particular area I went, no straight away they started joking laughing drawing that attention mm. and uh it the behavior started to of the woods started to escalate even more and got a bit more scary for them and eventually they uh rang me up and said i think we're going to just pack up and i said i maybe you want to might want to just leave a little offering before you pack up as soon as they put the offering out into the woods and decided they were packing up it dropped silent mm. Uh, and then they realised there was no animals, there was no life, there's no sign of anything in there. Uh, and as they got 
maybe 500 yards away from the campsite. Instantly they could hear birds, they could see owls, they could see everything. Got to their car park and there was no cars there, um, bar their car. Um, they're pretty convinced it was so far in the middle of nowhere. Couldn't have been the person there. The, um, and there's these guys are complete atheists. Mm. And they're all now like, we're not going back there unless you come with us. And I'm like, well, I don't think that would want you to go back there. <laughs> so they made their message pretty clear, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, yeah. I think going to ancient woodland and falling out hammocks and having laughs might draw some heat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had the experience of going out to the woods with my guitar and like just jamming around and really feeling like there's an audience. And if they're not into what you're doing, like, just something will drop on you, like an acorn will just drop on your head, and you're like, "Oh yeah, you, you guys probably weren't into that one." <laughs> I'll change up the vibe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's fascinating, you, you, and you do realize that uh, you 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 know you're noticed when you go into these places, and I think that it's very easy for us to. Uh, treat the natural world the the you know the wilder areas as simply a kind of um it's just like another room in a house that we're visiting you know um and then even some rooms have that kind of presence there already sometimes but yeah that's that's maybe another story yeah i mean the animal is quite interesting in lots of traditional cultures animal spirits have certain significant significance to them and uh if you're off the path so i have to find this if i find myself too um lost in the here and now of what life is um i see something an animal will do something you know i at the moment it seems to be owls seems to be the thing and um, I'll be lost in thought thinking about, you know, how am I going to pay rent this year, uh, this month? How am I going to bring in the next bit of money, a bit of work or, you know, problems to do with X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And an hour presents itself. And it draws you back into the significance of things. And uh, I've heard, or well, I was reading a book on, uh, I can't remember it was years ago, but it was saying that when you see these symbols and you're outside of nature, that's, an indication to come back onto the path and really i think the thing is when we find ourselves back in a natural environment everything slows down the distractions slow down and so you're able to see or sense these messages that are subtly floating around these little keys these little gifts that the universe sends us um that when we're in an urban environment there's just too many distractions you know there's too much noise it's like um trying to hear what someone's saying when you've got headphones on play, blaring heavy metal music you, it, it, it's hard it's there it's just you, you know you see it's, it's a lot harder to hear it yeah mm, mm. Well, the owl was uh an animal with a lot of a lot of shamanic significance and archetypal significance isn't it so yeah that's uh, interesting that that you're experiencing that a lot at the moment yeah well i mean that's part of my particular journey and i mean there have been stages where it's been other animals or animal spirits that i've noticed but um i think uh i think that yeah owl seems to be the one at the moment and and it doesn't it doesn't actually surprise me deep down because i know that i'm going through a particular shift and you know a period of things one chapter dying of and or moving on to the next chapter so but i haven't seen else for ages and i'm going to frequenting the same spots so either i wasn't aware or dialed in enough to see them or that now that they're presenting themselves um and perhaps they weren't before yeah so yeah that's my particular take away from that one mm. Mm. but like you said the very powerful shamanic tool i mean i find that media is quite an interesting one because sometimes i get things so right or sometimes i get things so wrong and i do love the whole role that the owl tends to play in media generally because um it's not far off the mark mm. Mm. yeah it's the 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 old uh, sort of 
Eurasian, Central Asian kind of shamanic initiations, of, as I understand it, would often be uh, the first episode would be the person gets carried off by a giant owl. And then that, you know, that's the beginning of it is once, you know, they're, they're on their journey now. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I believe it's a sort of, it, it's even people outside of those cultures have had those experiences. Uh, and it's been in our culture, it's put down to UFO abduction, uh, alien abduction or whatever it is. If there's some giant owls that live on another planet, I think maybe we're talking about something, <laughs> so it has something more shamanic, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I think the owl is an indicator. And the messenger thing, it's quite funny, the whole Harry Potter thing, everyone seems to know it, and they've got, you've messed, they've got their owls that they send to send messages. Hmm. I think um, I think sometimes that's a bit of a subversion of the fact that it's a indicator of a journey and maybe a companion of a journey. Um, and like you said, the I'm familiar also with that, the, that, that is the, the, the beginning, the symbolism of the, the first chapter into wherever wherever things are progressing um you know the, the deer also is one that you see in a, a lot in uh, many cultures uh and all stag particularly um white stag is one that uh, i've experienced myself but i've heard others um have some pretty powerful um understanding or experiences with yeah it's um I think that those animals also are still around very much with us. Um, and I think that, again, the bear, wolves, beavers, big cats, all of these things, you know, otters you're starting to see, obviously, again, they're speaking about reintroducing European bison into various places. Yeah. Our, our ancestors would have had a better relationship or understanding with those. And they, and the, um, the force that those uh, or the abilities that those animals carry with them um, and whereas we tend to have we tend to see what we see now which is um the owls the survivor it has survived the deer is still around um, they thrive they've got no predators now um but it'd be interesting to, I, I, i've always wondered if i had a time machine to, and you could go back to see what the world would have looked like then it would have been a very different thing wouldn't it yeah, uh, yeah totally yeah. it's fascinating isn't it so the the primeval forest of britain in yeah the sort of the stone age would have looked mm. completely different in so many ways to you know i mean one thing i've read is that scott's pine would have been a lot more common um just one little detail so you would have seen a lot more pine trees probably but also just the you know the flora and fauna would be yeah of a, of a very different quality um much richer mm. yeah i mean the um i i found that uh, the whole hari um ghost warriors from the sort of Ger germanic culture um uh, and the whole fall of the legion as they tra tra traverse through the through the, the the forest and when you actually listen to the description of what that germanic forest looked like the Teutoburg forest and that sort of area it was dark it was overgrown it was wild you know we don't really have an understanding of what that is particularly in our island because even if you go up to scotland and Wales and places like that, there still is man's involvement. You know, they don't have those real, you know, the Black Forest in Germany kind of, I think is still pretty close to a point, but that, 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 the, the darkness of, to live in under a canopy like that and to, to, to just get spun around. I mean, without compasses and without navigation equipment, it would be really easy to get lost in the woods. Mm when all you see is woodland, the same woodland. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about pines. Yeah, They're unlike um, unlike some of the other trees that we've got in this country, you, you, in a pine forest is, is can be quite a scary place to be, you know, just from a resources point of view. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, ever-ending. So, uh, yeah, I would love to have... Um, to really have captured that. And, you know, sometimes we see these uh, documentaries on TV, 
and they have um, like recreation, like di- walking with dinosaurs or whatever it is. I'd love to see one where they just focused on what the world would look like mm. at various stages. Um, because there must, I'm sure that there's hundreds of books and amazing minds that have turned to that. And I'm, there probably is a documentary somewhere I'm not familiar with, but I'd love to have that picture because I've kind of, in my head, I've got an idea of what it looked like, but I'm sure it's probably way off of the way off the mark. Mm. <laughs> you, you mentioned the boar earlier and the cult of the boar. Uh, this is an interesting one because it's, the, the boar is a, a prey, a sort of well sought after prey and meat, uh, but also it has this kind of aggressive temperament. They can be extremely dangerous as well. So, yeah, what, what's your thoughts on the significance of the boar for these sort of ancient northern cultures? So it's a tricky one. So there's not a lot written sources wise. If you want to go to the sources like um, was, I won't revisit the ones from the from sort of bear and wolf cults. But I think the thing with the boar is, is it's an omnivore and much like the bear really the bear, bears will eat all sorts to survive and the, and the boar will eat all sorts to survive i mean we think of pigs um and what they will eat well yeah pigs will eat anything they bought and they they essentially the domesticated equivalent of what a boar is but the tusk um and we and there there is talk of tusks being worn as amulets boar skins being worn uh, as clothing and, and trophies and it's a food source, but it's a food source that's not without its dangers, much like the bear. So all the topics that were spoken about to do with the bear, all those dangers with the bear are just as real with the boar. Mm. Um, so I think that personally they would have held the same and the boar would do exactly what the bear does. It, 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 they are almost mirrored in, in many respects, that they will fight to the last, they're stubborn, they will fight with their back against the wall, and they'll be relentless. You know, they will either win or get away from the situation, or they'll die trying. And so for me, I think that um, the two are so entwined that the almost it wouldn't surprise me one day if some saga is found somewhere or some scrap of evidence is found that denotes that you know uh, berserkers or bear shirts were actually would have worn boar skins as well it wouldn't surprise me because mm. i can see that the parallels between the two animals are there and particularly because the later day this fixation with the viking age that people seem to have um they sort of miss the fact that there was a huge amount of time that led up to that yeah. and the culture had been established. You're seeing the tail end of that culture, but that culture's roots are way before um, the whole Thor's hammer was may have been a stone axe at one point. Hmm. There's scholars that believe that, that that's exactly the case. Um, and so I, for me, I think that the boar has just as special a place as the bear does, and particularly for myself. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, certainly in a lot of artwork uh, and sort of artifacts from the, the Celtic world and the, I should imagine the Germanic world as well and there's kind of once you get far back enough in history they're kind of the same so it's like yeah so you know the the the, the Gundestrup cauldron from you know found in Denmark a sort of fine piece of like ancient Celtic art that's found in Denmark and how did it get there well I mean the people were pretty you know they're pretty close all these tribes were, were mixing up mingling but um these fantastic bits of sort of boar artwork and the carnix the sort of the old war trumpets with the some of them would be shaped with the boar's head it's really really there's a i heard a guy reconstructed them and made recordings of the sound mm. it's it's freaky <laughs> like it's freaky like the you know free jazz but applied to military military hardware <laughs> it's really strange you know oh yeah and of course and also the the structure of them or the constructions of them made people look so much taller and so you, you know to see a bunch of 
uh, warriors coming over the the hills or masses of them and these sort of bronze trumpets giving them another two foot on height must have just looked weird and alien to someone who's never seen something like that particularly with the noises yeah i mean i've i've, I've, I've often wondered about that one um yeah i mean the the balls definitely hold us definitely hold a special place in the north european culture whether it be celtic or Germanic. i'm much like yourself i think that i mean celts arguably isn't a genetic thing it's a uh, cultural thing uh, and there isn't many changes or differences between germanics cults at uh, celts and um and the nordic if you like it was all the same sort of route and there's so many parallels and principles and shared myths and uh shared uh origin um roots I think that um, it doesn't surprise me that you can see the same symbolism of animals or totemic animals um, uh, in artwork, in in stories, in uh, decoration to do with you know jewelry. I mean that a lot of what we know comes from jewelry, comes from met metallic finds because cloth obviously biodegrades. But when you look at those. Um, like that particular, um, the cauldron there. I mean, um, <clears throat> besides the pillar in Rome, those two are the only, the Quranus um, or Quranus um, imagery. It's only really those two that are the most famous. And that's a partial, the one in Rome hmm. uh, from the Roman Empire. So it's, it, that's interesting as well, the fact that that, had appeared in the Roman Empire on a pillar and then also you know, on the cauldron. So, yeah, there's a lot of cross pollination, I think, that went on. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah as I believe there's actually sort of carnexes depicted on the cauldron as well, aren't there? Like sort of warriors. And then there's a kind of cauldron that someone's being dunked into, which sort of a cauldron of rebirth sort of thing. Um, but yeah, which is. So, so, I mean, I have a bit of content on this and I come to my own conclusions. I think that one of the biggest dangers, or not sorry, one of the biggest dangers, the fact that reincarnation and the whole three dog principle, you see so many in so many different cultures. Uh, and reincarnation, I think, is very much a thing uh, in ancient Celtic or Germanic culture. I think mm. that unless you took your place amongst the ancestors, my particular um, view or understanding that I've come to, not through study, but through my own experiences, is that you would probably reincarnate through your ancestral line mm. until eventually you become an ancestor and you can guide your ancestral line. Of course, uh, that could easily be corrupted into some sort of supremacist thing. Um, and that's the fear and why that people would avoid such a, a ideology. But also it's an empowering thing, isn't it? Because um, I think I've spoken about this before, like I have children. Um, if my children have children, I would still want to do everything for my children's children. Mm. But if I was blessed enough to see my children's children, um, I would still treat them the same and have the same love that I have had. Yes, okay, I haven't raised them myself, but they're still my ancestral line, they're still my children. Mm. And to extend that further down the generations, you, many of your ancestors would have that same feeling. If, if you know their hearts and intentions were pure, I mean, there are bad people in, or mm, there are people that abuse their power one way or another. Um, I'm sure there would be some in my ancestral line and your ancestral line, but the majority of people will have love and reverence for their own kind. <laughs>